Hey, what's up, guys? John here. I'm sitting here with Andy, who is heading Crowd Health, and they are changing the way in which healthcare is delivered here in America. I look forward to learning about healthcare and kind of this entire space because it's extremely expensive. The average plan for a family of four, from what I've read, is about twenty-four thousand dollars a year. Yeah, is that right? It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, and that's not even including the deductible. You know, I went to healthcare.gov uh, a few months ago during open enrollment, and for I have two girls. And for me, my wife, and my two girls, it was fourteen hundred bucks a month. Uh, so that's what seventeen thousand dollars a year, yep. and then a fourteen thousand dollar deductible. So basically, what that means is I have to come out thirty one thousand dollars before a health insurance plan will pay a dime. So I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that's absolutely ridiculous. It's, it's absurd. When did you start to get into the healthcare space, and why did you start to kind of go in this avenue? Yeah, I, I always wanted to be entrepreneurial ever since I was little. Um, and kind of funny story is I was out at Stanford for business school. I graduated in 2006, and this was the time where you know Google was taking off. And funny story, I have, have you seen the, the the movie The Social Network? Yeah, of course. Yeah, so you know there's a subplot of that movie where Zuckerberg brought all of his buddies from Boston to Silicon Valley, and they got this house for mm -hmm. the summer um, and, and Eduardo had to go get, I think 16 or $18,000 from his dad. And they're like, how am I gonna get this money? Well, that house they rented was actually my house. Oh wow! So they rented their house from me and my my business school classmates who were out doing our internships for the summer. So that was our house in the movie. There was no zip line from the uh, chimney, but otherwise it was pretty pretty spot on. That's so, pretty awesome. Yeah, and so I, I tell that story because it was just a crazy time in Silicon Valley, but I wanted to do something different. So I bought a company in of all places, Dayton, Ohio, that was a healthcare company and didn't know anything about healthcare, but learned a lot. Um, owned that company for seven or eight years and then sold it. Um, it was negative 12 degrees in Ohio the day I sold it. And it was the day I realized that God did not intend for people to live in Ohio in, right. in the wintertime. <laughs> yeah. So I moved down to, to Austin. And um, and since I didn't have uh, health insurance because I had sold my company, most of us get our health insurance to our employer. Yeah, I was reading it's like 49% of Americans. Yeah, exactly. Um, I didn't have health insurance anymore, and so I went on to the uh, the exchange, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. They're all the same thing, and got a plan, and it was twelve hundred dollars a month for me, my wife, and my two girls. And I joke it; it worked until I had to use it. My little one was having recurring ear infections, and so we went to the ear, nose, and throat doctor, who said she had a hole in her eardrum. So there's one hospital in town that was in network, and that's the other thing about insurance companies: like, is it in network? Is it out network? You got to figure all that stuff out. So we went to this hospital. And it was a 15 minute procedure to fix it. And uh, we got the bill and it was $8,000. And we were just blown away the fact that eight, you know, $8,000 for 15 minutes. And uh, we're like, all right, well, this is what health insurance is for. Like, this is the whole point. Yeah. Um, you know, before we started, you told me your son broke his wrist. Like, that's what we need health insurance for, right? Um, well, unfortunately, a few weeks later, the health insurance plan said that it was medically unnecessary. And so they weren't going to pay for it. And so I was stuck with an $8,000 bill, um, even though I had health insurance. You know, it was at that moment, I was like, man, this, this thing's got to change. And so we're just on a mission to kind of burn down the existing healthcare system. Today's video is sponsored by Great Credit Fast. Do you want to invest in real estate or possibly Airbnb? Maybe you want to start and grow a company or a business or possibly get debt free. With Great Credit, you're able to achieve all of this and much, much more. The last thing that you want to do is borrow money from a credit card company paying 25 or 27 percent interest because when you look at the real numbers and you look at what's actually happening in the economy that's the worst strategy and it's almost a guaranteed failure take a look at this so if you're borrowing ten thousand dollars at a 27 percent interest rate paying 250 bucks a month it's going to take about nine years to pay this off and about sixteen thousand dollars in wasted resources paid to one of these credit card companies however with great credit you're able to do a balance transfer in most cases and get debt free for 0% interest and pay this off in a fraction of the time. In 2008, banks started tightening up lending restrictions and that's exactly what they are doing now. They're getting ready to tighten up lending restrictions, meaning that if you have that low credit score, 400, 500, 600 credit score, if you're in that even low 700s, it becomes much more challenging to get access to money. But if you look at Blackstone, for example, Blackstone, they are using their credit and their relationships to raise money. They've just raised $30 billion to invest in single family rentals. If you wanna invest in real estate, you wanna really grow in scale during the greatest wealth transfer of all time, you're gonna need great credit to do it. We would love to give you a free consultation to see how we can help you at greatcreditfast.com. That's greatcreditfast.com. 
or give us a call at 561-430-5900. Now back to the show. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, they said it's medically unnecessary. Medically unnecessary. That they, you should just, your daughter should just be, you know, in that state for, for yeah. Here's future. the crazy thing about this is uh, our ear, nose, and throat doc delayed his vacation by a day to do this because he was so worried about her long-term hearing loss. Um, the other thing is, is she stopped having ear infections after that. So I, it worked. So yeah. it must have been medically necessary. And so, yeah, I mean, just these, these um, health plans can arbitrarily say that it's medically necessary and you, 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 there's no recourse. Like there's just nothing we could do about it. We just had to stroke an $8,000 check to the local hospital. You know, the crazy thing about this is 200,000 families every year go bankrupt due to health expenses even though they have health insurance. Yeah. Because they're denying claims. Most people don't have $8,000 laying around. Most people don't have $400 laying yeah, around. Yeah, exactly. Or, um, you know, they, they, they deny these, these claims or these deductibles. You know, if, if I have, my family had a $14,000 deductible, I, most people don't have $14,000, right? No. So, you know, there people are getting themselves into plans they just don't fully understand that, um, you know, Based uh, on a payment which they think they can afford. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, I was reading it's twenty uh, percent of Americans have a medical collection on their credit report, yeah. negatively impacting their score. It's, I, I've I've seen higher. That's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. And then the other thing too is you know we're here in Florida. One out of every I think it's seven uh, claims in Florida are denied. So you have a one in seven chance of your claim being denied by your health insurance plan. I'm in Texas. We're one out of five. So twenty percent. Because again, the, these they health insurance plans are like, nah, unnecessary, sorry. And I, like I said, there's nothing we can do about it. I mean, we can complain to these big corporate entities that oftentimes are paid off by these health insurance plans, but they rarely do anything. So th how does it work? Do the doctors have a specific deal with the insurance company? Do they, like, how does that relationship, what does that relationship look like behind Yeah, the typically scenes? the insurance company is contracted with the doctor but the doctor has to get approval from the insurance company to do any significant procedure. And in my case, the doctor got approval from the insurance company. We went to the hospital that was had a contract with the insurance company, but the insurance company still was able to come back and be like, nope, we're not gonna pay for it. Um, and so, you know, that's the craziness of this system is the insurance company can say, yep, you're good, but just, you know, three or four months later being like, nah, just kidding, that was medically unnecessary. And you're stuck with an eight thousand dollar bill. Yeah, because by law you have to have some form of health insurance, right? Well, you don't actually. Oh, um, really? You there's there's no penalty for not having health insurance in all but five states. So I thought Obamacare like uh, they forced you or educate me on that. So they I got removed. They, they oh, got really? Removed. Yeah. So you don't have to have health insurance anymore unless you're in uh, let's see Vermont, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, California. And uh, I'm missing one, um, DC. There's there might New Jersey. Okay. So those are the ones that you 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 have to have health insurance, or you will pay a, a penalty. Mm -hmm. Most of our members in those those uh, those states don't have health insurance. They're still members of Crowd Health. They just pay the penalty because we save them so much more money than what the penalty is. So it actually works out great. What is the penalty? Like a percentage of income? It's a percentage of income, mm -hmm. and that is up to a max. So it's you know it's typically a couple grand. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. What is uh what do a lot of people don't I guess not realize about that relationship between the doctor and the insurance company? Is there some type of um, hidden deal in the background? Like how well uh, you know actually the 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 little docs the docs who typically take care of us on a day to day basis yeah. the primary care docs the OBGYNs hate health insurance. Actually, most docs hate health insurance. Is it because the health insurance companies renegotiate on the back end and kind of stiff yeah. them? Yeah, I mean, they, you have these big health insurance companies who come in and say, "Hey, I, I'm going to, you know, only give you, uh, you know, 35 bucks per visit," and so you have to have like 10 to 15 visits um, every uh, hour to actually make any money, right? And so if you think about it, like you're going and seeing your doctor, they're only spending 10 minutes with you, and on, on average, it's six. And so what are you going to learn from your doctor in six to 10 minutes? Not a lot, right? Right. Like we should be getting into nutrition. We should be getting into lifestyle choices. We should be getting into sleep and exercise. You just can't do that for six to 10 minutes. And so these health insurance plans are re reducing reimbursement for the small docs. And so the small docs are kind of like, look, this is the only way I can make money. Or what they do 
is they sell it to a hospital system. And so now you're a part of a hospital system. You don't own your practice anymore. And these hospital systems then negotiate with the insurance companies and your rates go up significantly. But they dictate and determine the procedures in which you do? Exactly. So you basically have no authority. You're just an employee for yeah. Kaiser or whatever. Yeah, hospitals. I mean, imagine, you know, whoever's listening out there, You're if you're a, an expert in your field, you're an expert in, in podcasting. If you had somebody on your shoulder telling you what you can and can't do, how to do your job, that would be really frustrating. That would be really annoying. Right, I wouldn't right? do it. I w- you wouldn't do it. And so most of these docs are like, man, I'm just kind of like a, a slave to the man now, right? Mm-hmm. And they are burning out, and, and a lot of them are changing careers and getting out of medicine because they don't want to deal with, with health insurance companies. Yeah, I was listening to a lady who has a practice in Beverly Hills, a dentist, talking about a lot of people think that you, know, you make so much money being a dentist, but the reality is there's so much regulation, yeah. and the insurance companies are so difficult yeah. that you'd have to see like X amount of patients every single day just to keep the lights on, and it's just technically impossible. Yeah. So she's closing down her practice, and it's just like yeah. – it, it opened my eyes to it because I thought – if you're a dentist or you're a doctor, you know, for many years, you're making a lot of money and you're doing really, really well. And it was just until like the last year or so, realized that it's probably not the picture at all. It's not the case. For most doctors, it's not the case. They're, they're struggling to get by day to day given the current, you know, insurance rates. And so, you know, what, what I say is like, look, hey, I don't want to bill insurance if you'll spend some more time with me, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll pay you double in cash if I can spend some more time with you and actually get some value out of this. What do you mean? Um, So just for example, um, a lot of these doctors are transitioning to a cash-only system. They're not even taking insurance anymore, Hmm. right? So instead of spending six minutes, they're spending 30 minutes. Instead of getting 25 or 30 bucks, they're getting 100 to 150 bucks for that visit. But, you know, from my perspective and a lot of other people who pay in cash, I would way, I'd rather pay 100 or 150 bucks to my doctor and actually get something out of it so that I don't have to see you again for another year. <laughs> right. You know, if you spend six minutes with me, you're not gonna figure out what's going on with me. And so I'm just gonna see you three or four or five times a year because stuff is, is happening. So they're changing their model to be a cash pay model, which allows them to spend more time with patients, allows them to make more money. It allows the patients to be more um, engaged with their doctor. And that's kind of the new system that's being, being built up, um, which I think is pretty interesting. So what is that, more like the home spital type of system where people are going to be spending more time with their doctor remotely? Or are you saying they're going to actually go into the office? Either way. Yeah, either way. I mean, I don't like going into my doctor's office. I mean, it's sitting with a bunch of sick people in the waiting room and waiting. It's not that fun. But virtual care, especially over the last three years, has like really blown up. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've used virtual care three or four times over the last year with my daughter or whatever. Right. And it's Same. just way, it's way easier. I mean, one quick example of this is you, you again, you had kids. Um, I have girls, so they're a little bit, a little bit different, but mm-hmm. mine, you know, love like jumping on their beds. Yeah, right? for sure. And so she was jumping on her bed. She fell off, whacked her head. And so I went in there. I was like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And she started talking and kind of weird. And so I got an urgent care doc on the phone. And within like 30 seconds, I got an urgent care doc. He's like, okay. I was like, I need to go to the ER, right? He's like, hold on a second. Ask her these five questions. And so he asked her like, what's your name? What's your birthday? You know, all these things. And he's like, if they, if she can answer those five questions, she's okay. If she can't, then she needs to go to the ER. So ask her those five questions. I think he said every 15 minutes. And if she can't answer them, then go, right? And so I did that. And, you know, thank God, like she could answer those five questions. But you know what I did? I just saved $5,000 from having to go into the ER. Yeah. Because if I would have went to the ER, they would have done an MRI. That's $3,500. They would have done a CAT scan, which is $3,500. We would have sat in the waiting room for five, five hours. And instead, I had a virtual care. I paid that guy 129 bucks for that visit. It saved me all kinds of time, all kinds of money. And I'm like, that's the way that healthcare should be. Right. right, and it's less traumatic for the kid. And it's less traumatic for the kid. Yeah. She's like, no ER, no ER. She was one at the time, right? So she yeah. could hardly speak. Like, no ER, no ER. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's that's just the way that, that healthcare should be. And I'm paying for that in cash as opposed to having to get approval from my health insurance company and all these kinds of things. It's just way more efficient. Yeah. yeah. You know, we were in Europe uh, a couple of years ago during like the peak, like near the peak mania of all the craziness. Mm-hmm. And my kid got sick. And we called a doctor to come in, and he came in, like, full hazmat suit. And it was just, like, <laughs> traumatizing for the kid. And he's and we ended up saying, you know what? I think we're good. Like, we did, yeah. ended up sending the doctor away. And it was just, like, a wake-up call as to, you know, 
they have to do what they're told that they have to do. Yeah. And so they're, they don't so much, at least from my opinion, they don't so much follow their own education. They follow the protocols in which they're hired to follow. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, there's, you know, doctors are in medical school for however long, right? They're medical school and residency and all these things for eight, 10, sometimes 12 years. And then they're not actually allowed to do what they, they learned, you know, because it's all dictated by hospitals or insurance companies or government regulations. And it's just like, they're a pawn in the system. Right. Um, and that's just not, not the way that doctors should be, um, yeah. should be treated. What is, so how you do, uh, Tell me more about crowd health. Like, how yeah. does that actually work? Yeah, so I, I, I kind of got into this place. Of like, I, I don't want big corporations to decide. I want it to be between me and my doctor. And so how do we actually do that, right? Um, it's easy for the little ones. Like, you know, for 129 bucks, I can see a virtual care doc, urgent care doc. Like, yeah. that's easy. That's not that big of a deal. But what happens when I have a big one, right? Because that's what everybody's scared about, the mm -hmm. big one. And it's like, man, maybe I can get a bunch of people who hate this big insurance company, government run system, who would all be willing to help each other out in the case of something happening, right? And so your your uh, your son broke his arm and let's just say it's $5,000. So what we do is we say, hey, you gotta have some skin in the game before you ask other people for money. So you, you take the first 500, we'll take the remaining 4,500 and we'll send it out to 45 people at Crowd Health and we'll say, hey, Will you help John with his his son's broken wrist? And if you do, then if you say yes, then $100 will go from their account to your account. And at the end of the day, you'll have $4,500 in your account plus your $500 is $5,000 to pay for your son's, uh, you know, broken, it was broken wrist, right? Yeah. Was, yeah, broken wrist. And so in essence, it's a community type of approach where, um, you know, before it was a corporate type of, of approach. And this has multiple benefits, but the couple of the ones that I think are the coolest is behavior is really important in healthcare, right? Do I just go to the ER all the time for whatever it is? No. Because that's really expensive. Right. You know, and if you're on health insurance, you kind of don't care, you know, because you're like, ah, whatever. Health yeah, insurance their problem. is paying for it. It's their problem. In this system, it's like, okay, it's like my buddy John is is the one that needs to pay for this. That's going to kind of help to pay for this. Like it's another human being on the other line, on the other side of yeah. this transaction that I'm not screwing United Healthcare. And at that point, I don't really care if I screw United Healthcare. It's the seventh largest company in the planet. Right. Um, but I don't want to screw John, right? Or Travis or Sarah or Amy or whoever, because they're really people on the other end. The other thing too is I actually know where my money is going, right? So mm -hmm. if I'm asked, I'm asked to help John's son, then I'm sending my money directly to John. And so, you know, as opposed to United Healthcare, who could spend it on any sorts of things that don't align with my values or where I want it to go. For so sure. in this case, it's I'm sending my money directly to John. And that's pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. We had a we had a, a woman who had a miscarriage. And so we sent it out to a bunch of people. And there was, there was medical costs associated with that. We had people coming back who said, you know what, that's a part of my story too. Like, I know what this woman is going through. I know what that family is going through. Like, how can we help them? You know, can I send, instead of $100, can I give them $200? Yeah. And you're like, never in a million years would you call United Healthcare and say, hey, can I send you more this month? Right. You know, and so it's like getting back to that community kind of component in our lives, which I think is ingrained in us that as over the last 50 years has gotten ripped out from our society, you know, by whether it's insurance or government or whatever, you know, people don't bring cookies to each other anymore when the neighbor moves in. Like they used to do that 30 or 40 years ago. They don't say hi to the neighbor anymore. They don't say hi. When a neighbor, when a neighbor moves in, what do, what do I care about the most? And I'm, I'm, I'm being honest on this one. Establish a good relationship with them. Yeah, establish, I don't want to piss them off. And I kind of want to know what they bought their house for because that's some kind of an indicator of how much my house yeah. is worth, right? And it's yeah. just like, it's not a community anymore. And so for me, it's like, I'd really like to get community back and have people feel like they're a part of something. And that's what we're trying to do with with healthcare. And man, so far it's working really, the, really great. So would like, do people pay a monthly, is it like a monthly fee plus, uh, like how does that work? Yeah, you pay me a monthly fee of 50 bucks. 50 bucks to be in the community community. And then if you're a single person, we'll ask you for an additional up to 135 bucks. So it's 185 bucks for an individual. Um, for a family, it's up to an additional 400 bucks. So family of four is about $600 a month. Okay. Which is, you know, significantly less than, you know, most other, you know, insurance uh, alternatives. 
So, yeah. I mean, like I said, Obamacare for us this year was like, I think it was 1400 bucks. Um, and then again, I don't have that big deductible. You're right. It's you only have to pay five hundred bucks for your 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 son's broken wrist. As what happens to if somebody gets been, like diabetes or they have like some really really big, yeah, six figure type of seven figure type? We of just situation. had a four hundred thousand dollar one. Oh really? Yeah, it was a bad illness a guy. Yeah, he was in the ER or he was in the hospital for weeks. So four hundred thousand dollars, and it's like we, twenty grand a day to be in the hospital. It's expensive. Yeah, <laughs> it's expensive. Um, and so what we did, what that bills, we negotiated that down. We actually negotiated it down to like seventy thousand from four hundred to seventy. And so then we went and we, you know, funded it with the community of people without a problem. It so got how do you funded in three days? How do you negotiate it down? Do you ask them for like an itemized list, and then you try to like shop it around at other providers and be like, oh, you're charging. 50 bucks for a band-aid they're charging eight yeah basically yes exactly okay. we're getting an itemized list we're running it through an algorithm we're looking at the line items it's like are you kidding me you're charging me 42 dollars for a an aspirin like that doesn't make any sense you know and there's there's laws that actually protect us i guess the government is good at some things but there are laws that protect us that say look if you don't agree to a price up front then you have to, in good faith, negotiate on the back end what the fair price is for something. Um, that's, you know, Federal Trade Act. There's uh, some commercial code as well, UCC 2-305, not to get too specific. But, like, there's actual laws that say you have to negotiate in good faith. And so we, on your behalf, will look at all these prices and say, these are unfair prices. These are egregious prices. And if you don't want to negotiate, we'll sue you. And we're going to win because here's all of the – you know, the regulation that that protects people from getting price gouged. So, you know, I was unfortunately in the ER six months ago. It ended up being nothing. Um, but for a three dollar uh bag of salt water, I was charged fifty three hundred dollars. That's absolutely for a three dollar. I can go on the internet, literally you can go on the internet and get this bag of salt water for three bucks. They charge me fifty three hundred bucks. I mean it's insanity when you look at some of these bills, what these hospitals will 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 charge you so what'd you do um i am currently negotiating with them and it looks like i'm gonna get that down by that entire bill down by 80 or 90 percent so you know still probably overpriced but significantly less than than what it was yeah so so i mean what generally what happens let's say for example someone has a fifty thousand dollar bill yeah they don't pay it uh goes on their credit report like a debt collector will buy it right for 10 or 20 cents in the dollar and then a little bit different you? little bit different so what, what that with hospitals what happens is is they will send it over to a debt collector pretty quickly but you, people got to realize about uh your credit score they can't impact your credit score for a year so you can hold you can wait on you can sit on it for a year and so when they send it to a debt collector that's basically them telling you they know they're not going to be able to collect 100 percent on this so they need somebody else to to take care of it for them the hospital's basically saying that and so we just say, hey, don't negotiate until it goes to a debt collector because that's where you have the most leverage. Hmm. And so we let it go to the debt collector. If the debt collector sends you things in the mail, um, I actually have a piece on this going out next week. And I tear them up and throw them in the trash can. They can't do anything. If they call you, you can either you know put it and say debt collector and ignore it, or you can just block it, block that number right out of your phone so they can't annoy you or you can actually say you're harassing me stop harassing me and they legally can't call you back so how long do you wait six months yeah about six months yeah typically you know and then they'll start negotiating I'll, I'll start negotiating right away like look here's what i think the fair price is you know if you're willing to do that i'll give you a credit card right now if yeah. you're not then i'm not interested you know and so then you every couple months i'll i'll have that conversation again and uh, ultimately, they'll be like, "Okay, fine. Like, let's do it." If they don't, then you just send it to an attorney, and the attorney, yeah, will sue we, them. We have a we have a, a network of attorneys who will sue them on your behalf. Um, so that's again, the attorney does ninety five percent of it. You just have to, you know, sign that you're okay with giving the, the the attorney the power to do that on your behalf. So they basically sign a power of attorney. The attorney will basically sue them for saying this is the fair price, yeah. and then they'll sue them in addition yeah. for like punitive damages. Yeah, and, and almost every time they would win. Yeah, I mean, we've not lost yet. Interesting. Yeah, where do you <laughs> where do you see this going over the next couple of years? The medical system. Do you think we're going to walk into? Because I think a lot has changed over the last four years. I think a lot of people would agree with that. The way in which you know people now, I think a lot of people are looking at health different 
they're looking at healthcare different, mm-hmm. their relationship with the doctor, everything is changing. Yeah. Do you, what do you think the next couple of years are going to look like for that? Yeah, I mean, I think what you're going to first see is you're going to see a lot of hospitals go out of business. Mm-hmm. Um, I think yeah, Ray Dalio is betting on that. Are are they're horrifically run, horrifically run. Um, you know, the fact that these hospitals are only getting three or four percent margin, and they're charging me fifty three hundred dollars for a three dollar bag of salt water. I mean, if you can't make money on that, you got a problem. Right, like, yeah. Um, and so, why is that? Uh, my my wife was a uh, a nurse in L.A. eight years ago. Yeah, and that hospital went out of business. Yeah, bureaucratic BS. In essence, what they're trying to do is they're saying, look, we're we're ta- we're we want the cost of service to be X, and then we're just going to add five percent on top of that for our five percent margin. If they get any more than that, then they get scrutiny. You know, if they you know go less than that, then they go bankrupt. So there's like, I'm just gonna tag five percent on to what the costs of healthcare is, and so you have an incentive then to see the cost of healthcare go up, mm-hmm. right? Because if you can, you can make five dollars on a hundred buck, you know, cost. Yeah, you can make ten dollars on a two hundred dollar cost. Why wouldn't you want to see it go up? Right. right. And actually, health insurance plans act the exact same way. And this is what we've seen in the the military industrial complex with the gov- federal government is the federal government says, hey, this is a cost plus deal. And so what is their incentive is, is they increase have an the incentive cost. to increase the cost. So you have hospitals who are in- incentivized to increase, increase the cost and the insurance companies are a cost plus system too. They And it, it's, it looks a little bit of a different way, but they're like, for every thousand dollars of premium, you can only make 150 bucks. So how do you grow that 150 bucks? Your premium has to go up. So right. where's the rest of the money go? Does it go back to the insurance companies or like insurance company? Yeah. Insurance companies take, take, well, there's so many middlemen in this. Yeah. The broker takes, you know, three to 6%. Who's the broker? Uh, so if you oftentimes, you know, people are using brokers, whether it's through their corporation or if, you know, an individual will use a broker too. So you'll call your broker and you'll say, Hey, find me a really good health plan. And the broker will take somewhere between three and 6% of that. Of what? The annual premium? Of the annual premium. Yeah. And so that that sucks. You know, that's just bureaucratic stuff. And by the way, you don't need a broker if it was easy to understand. Right. Like the whole point of having a broker is it's easy to understand. Like I got a fight here this morning. I used, you know, uh, went directly on American Airlines because I know that they fly to Miami. It's really easy. It's simple. Yeah. I can go and do it. And there's no and there's, there's no intermediaries between me and American. Um, and so once you can do that, you can suck out all those costs. Your, pre, your premiums will go down by three to six percent if you can just take the broker out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then you've got the health insurance plan on top of that. You've got the hospital on top of that. They're all taking these bureaucratic, you know, um, we we call them rent seeking. Right. It's one of those things where you you're just if you're there, you're going to get paid. So um, it funny enough is only eight percent of healthcare costs go to doctors. So we have, um, you know, four point four point five ish trillion dollars of of healthcare costs. Um, we have uh, a million uh, doctors who make on average three hundred twenty-five thousand dollars a year, and so that's let's say three hundred and twenty-five billion dollars a year goes into healthcare costs of the four point five. That's just the math. It's yeah. eight. Per- it's around eight percent plus or minus. I added benefits on top of that too, so it gets you to eight percent. So only eight percent of our healthcare cost total healthcare spend in the United States goes to doctors, which is crazy. Yeah. So it means bureaucracy is through the roof these big buildings that everybody wants to you know go to the you know yay big new hospital building well guess what you're paying for it right like that's why our healthcare system is so expensive is everybody wants to build new buildings and and the crazy part to me is like i don't know why anybody gives to a hospital you know like have you ever seen these like hospital fundraisers yeah they're like we're building a new building and it's for babies and moms well guess what they're doing there they're charging egregious amounts to me and you for having a baby there, mm-hmm. right? Like you're funding a corporation in essence to egregiously bill people for and use extract of that wealth in the middle and class. extract wealth from, I mean, it's, I, I don't understand these people who give to these big hospitals. Um, it feels good, I guess, is the reason why, but they're just using it to extract value out of the, the local economy. So you think a lot of these hospitals are going to go down and there's going to be what, like in big cities, they'll go from having 50 hospitals to 10? Yeah, and I think you're going to see specialization. I think you're, the, the hospitals are going to be downsized. You're going to see a specialization. Um, we're already seeing a rise of what they call ambulatory, ambulatory surgery centers, which is basically outpatient um, surgeries. You know, in Austin, we had a, a member you know, just a little while ago who tore her ACL playing pickleball. Um, the hospital would do it for $22,000. 
the local ambulatory surgery center would do it for $11,000. Same doctor, same anesthesiologist, just a different location. Like that, that, that business model doesn't work for very long, right? If you're the hospital and you're, you have to charge twice as much for them to do surgery there. Right. And, and uh, most of the people listening who's never been to an ambulatory surgery center, it's like the Ritz Carlton, whereas the hospital is like the courtyard. Right. Like that's what it feels like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you walk into a place that feels like a spa as opposed to the hospital, which is like the last place I ever want to set like foot a red in. roof in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you say the red roof in, yeah. right? And so these people, these ambulatory surgery centers are going to extract value out of hospitals for especially these high margin uh, surgeries that they do. And I think the hospitals will at, at, at some point either shut down or close, you know, big wings or, or things like that. That is going to be the indicator that healthcare is starting to get fixed. Do you think that we're going to see a lot of like where are these doctors going to go? Because if we downsize, downsize hospitals to that capacity, I think more doctors are going to go towards the, the the cash pay yeah reimbursement as opposed to the insurance paid reimbursement, right? And especially if I can get some real scale behind Crowd Health, we just hit seventy five hundred members, I think, yesterday, which awesome. is great. Yeah, um, if I can get that to seven hundred and fifty thousand members, then I can get some scale, so I can start paying doctor. You know, our members can pay doctors in cash, have them in salary. Yeah, and then you know they can actually make enough in cash so that they can ditch the insurance component of it and it's better for them it's more direct it's you know all the reasons we've talked about so i think that's going to be what's going to happen over the next decade i'm, I'm hoping we're already starting to see consumer-based health care um, be a lot more kind of um kind of amenable to people in in paying for health care do you think we're going to see like the doctors now they're uh, i guess by law they have to follow certain protocols set yeah. by the government right if they end up leaving the hospital and they end up doing their own practice, are they still able to do that? Yeah, because a lot of these these uh, things that they have to do is not just the government, but it's their big hospital systems. Right. Right. So the big hospital systems, one of the problems is, is if you go to your local doctor and they're a part of the hospital system, then they are incentivized to go and send their patients to other groups within that hospital system. Right. It may not be the lowest cost. It may not be the best. Because you have a contract, they're going to refer you their plumber. Yeah. They're going to refer you their... Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. So these doctors will be able to have way more freedom to be able to send you to the best knee doctor in town, right? Or the best ear, nose, and throat doc, um, because they have, have now have options of everybody as opposed to just the doctors within their system. So again, lots more freedom freedom of choice, that's all a good thing. If we can pull some of these doctors out of the system, then I think that would be a huge win for the entire system and for the patient, which is probably the most important. Um, and we can start paying for more of these things in, in cash. I mean, think about your health insurance. If you could reduce your health insurance by 50%, and now you could use that money to either you know take your kids on vacation or whatever, or you can use that money to go buy healthcare stuff that you actually want, right? That you actually use as opposed to that subsidizing big insurance companies and people not taking care of themselves and all this garbage that's going on in our world right now, like that would be a awesome outcome, right? Yeah. Um, more money in our own pockets so we can choose what to do with that money as opposed to an insurance plan choosing what to do with that money. Man, that's just a win-win. And that's what we're trying to do. Do like, the current insurance companies make more money with the sicker the patient is? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like I said earlier, like if your $1,000 premium goes to, let's just say 10% goes up, you know, to 1100, then they make, you know, another, you know, what, 10 bucks per, right. per member per month. And so if people get healthier, that means the healthcare costs go down. Mm -hmm. And so they make less per member per month. If they get sick, if the population gets sick, then the revenue per member per month keeps going up. Yeah, I think they said that seventy-seven. There's going to be a seventy-seven percent rise in cancer cases over the next like couple days. It would not shock me, yeah. right? And so at one point, the 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 insurance companies they have this thing like, oh my gosh, we're getting, we have to take care of all these cancer patients. We got to raise premiums, like government, like yeah. let us raise premiums. You know, they 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 play the victim, which is kind of like our culture. Let's play the victim mentality on this. Mm -hmm. And they were able to raise rates, and the government's like, okay, well, I guess you have to raise rates. Well, guess what? They make more money. Yeah. They make more money doing that. So the entire medical industrial complex, which is what I call it, three three primary, you know, cartel members in that, um, pharma, um, hospitals, health insurance companies, they all make more money when they're sick. Right. So what is their incentive system? Let's follow the incentive system. I mean, it's it's crazy that we don't have a, you know, cancer drug at this point. Yeah. You know, over 
50 years, maybe even longer, 75 years of looking for one. Yeah. I mean, yet, well, yet there's we more can, money to be. We can figure out in three months, right? Like, <laughs> you're like, how does that make any sense? It just yeah. doesn't. It just doesn't yeah, make yeah. any sense, you know? Um, and so you know, these are these pharma insurance companies and hospitals are all driven towards profit, which I don't have any problem with. Yeah. But let's set up an incentive system where they're actually incentivized to make us healthy instead of, you know, incentivized to make us sick. That's what we really want. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I've, I've read a lot about how, like, a, this home spital network is going to continue to grow over the next couple of years. Yeah, I think so. And these uh, hospitals are going to continue closing up. And, uh, and what they said is they're going to start being able to make organs and different things through like 3d printers and uh, what do you think about that do you think that's actually gonna all happen i just heard the other day um this guy who had i think it was bladder cancer just uh had a not, not just i think it was six months ago had a transplant from a pig and or a bladder yeah. from a pig um and they were able to, to to resolve his bladder cancer and now he's living six months he's six months in and he doesn't have to. He's not. He's not on dialysis anymore, which is super expensive. Yeah. Um. I'm like, holy crap! Like that's awesome. Yeah. And so I do think that's going to be the case. You know, I, I do think the fact that though some of these people, these companies, are going to figure out how to do things much, much less expensive, being able to go directly to the masses, who instead of saying, okay, well, I'm going to wait a year or two years or never to get a new bladder, I'm going to go and figure out how to get one from you know, probably some Elon Musk company or something that builds bladders, right? right, right, right <laughs> out, of, yeah. out, of, out of nowhere. And um, it's actually going to be a consumer-driven type of thing, which is where I think we need to go. If you take consumerism out of something, it, the price is going to go up, right. right? And we see that in healthcare. We see that anything that healthcare touches, government touches, price goes up. Let's make it, you know, a little more um, directly to the mass and, and get that price down. And I think that's ultimately what should happen. Now, whether it will, the government, you know, is going to fight like hell to keep control of of your your healthcare. So, we'll see. Yeah, I was reading. Uh, or no, I was talking to Meat Mafia yeah. when I was there in Austin a couple. What was it, seven eight weeks ago? Yeah, they're talking about how the food, the entire food system is going to change. Oh, same thing. And like everything's going to start going to plant based. And you know, they're. I want. What do you think the impact of that could be on health? Awful. Well, obesity was one percent in nineteen seventy. I was sorry. Excuse me. Diabetes was one percent in nineteen seventy. It's now 10%, right? So we have, you know, 10 x the number of people with diabetes because the government came out in the 1980s and said, hey, here's this food pyramid, you know, and, you yeah. know, you got all these grains <laughs> yeah. on the bottom, you know, pasta and, you know, all this good stuff on the bottom. And then, you know, as you go up, then it's vegetables and it's meat and just a little bit of dairy, you know, up there. And I'm like, man, like, why is that the case? And that's the case because the people who have the money – all these grain, you know. They'll uh, tell you that's the case. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're the ones that have the money. They're the ones that are dictating this stuff, and so it's just going to keep going to be a total blunder of sickness and people eating garbage, which is going to fuel the healthcare, you know, me the medical industrial complex to continue to gain more money. I mean, I, I think it's just a it's a total. I mean, I, I'm maybe calling a conspiracy theorist, but like it's a conspiracy to keep getting us more sick and sick and sick. You're going to eat more garbage. You're going to use more health care. Everybody's going to be more profitable. Yet, I think our country goes to hell because we have, go from 10% of diabetes to – I mean, I saw the stat the other day. It was, it's something like 50% of kids under the age of 18 are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. I mean, it's – that's scary as hell. It is. Right? Like, how do we look at that and say that's a good thing? But everybody's kind of like, well, I got – you know, the government tells me this is the way it is, so it must be. I'm like – it's ridiculous. So yeah, I mean, it's uh, they said like half the kids will have autism or something in the next. I think it was like ten years, yeah. twelve years, and it's just it is scary how fast the world is changing and not in a good way in some areas. In other areas, there's a lot of disruption. Like what you guys are doing is yeah. really cool, but it's definitely we're going from where we were, you know, cruising at sixty miles an hour ten years ago, five years ago, to now things are changing like hundred miles an hour. Yeah, absolutely. And back to what I was talking about before, like, what if you had a little extra money every month that you're not paying on health care that you can actually go and get, like, really good food as opposed to the garbage that you're getting in the middle of the grocery store, right? Like, what if you could up your food game to be more protein-rich, more fat, you know, less of this, you know, uh, just industrialized medicine or uh, food 
I think that could have a massive impact. My wife just sent me something on Instagram like an hour ago, just before we got here, uh, about a local farmer that sells meat directly to yeah, consumers. Yeah, yeah. And she's like, we need to buy stuff. Like, yeah, you because know, we go to Whole Foods and you look at the chicken now, or you look at like any of that steak, it looks very different than what yeah. it did a couple of years ago. Yeah, it tastes totally. very, very different. It totally does. It yeah. totally does. And we're ingesting all those chemicals and all that crap. And nobody knows how it's impacting your body. But it's like, if you stick a bunch of chemicals that your body doesn't recognize in your body, the outcome is not good. I don't care you know, what study that you've done to show that it's fine. I mean, I just, I can't, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. So yeah, should go, go shake your local rancher's hand. I mean, that's the right way of doing it is go and get your, your, your meat, your produce, your eggs, all that kind of stuff from your, a local source because, you know, shit really hits the fan, you know, and, and some of our you know, transportation thing goes, you know, to hell and all those things. We're, we're not going to have the, I think it's like four, Four major corporations. Yeah, like, that's what they were saying. Own like our food system. Forty-five uh, hundred bits of. I think it was Brett saying it was forty-five. Four corporations control forty-five. Yeah, hundred uh, products which we all eat. Yeah, yeah. We saw also saw it during right where you go through the grocery store and there was like nothing left. Like, what would that? What What would happen if that was on a continuing basis? Right. That's what I'm saying. Is like build a relationship with the local person so that you can just drive down the street and go get your eggs or your beef or whatever. You don't have to rely upon the industrialized food network to get you your food. Like, I think that's worth the investment. Yeah, personally. so we used to get milk directly from, uh, like, a local farmer or yeah. six months ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he can't, like, deliver it to you. You have to pick it up from him. We get milk and butter. We have to pick it up, like, in this alley. It's almost like a drug deal. Yeah. To, like, pick up this milk because I think he was just walking into problems. Well, here's the crazy thing is, you know, now our, our, our governments are allowing people to, like, shoot up drugs on the street and just let them there. Yet you're trying to pick up milk directly from a cow, <laughs> yeah. and they're gonna they're 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 gonna hammer you, yeah. right? Like you got to do that in an alley. Like it's yeah. it's it's crazy yeah. to me, you know how how screwed up the system has gotten. So yeah, I mean I, I think there's gonna be a big change over the next decade. I hope there's going to be you know for the good. Yeah, people are gonna start finally realizing this. I'm hoping maybe I'm just being naive. <laughs> well, no, you mentioned the uh, if there's a problem with food. You heard about the Baltimore Bridge yeah. situation, right? Sure. The Baltimore Bridge happened, and then at the same exact time, the Red Sea, there's disruption there. The Suez Canal, the Panama Canal, there's all these different uh, levels of disruption happening right now in the supply chain, Yeah, which I think could have a really uh, interesting impact on – we could potentially see shortages. I'm not sure if we're going to see like radical shortages, but we could definitely see some disruption coming. And I think people are going to start looking for change as they start to see the world changing, and they're going to start taking maybe more priority over their health. Yeah. Um, what do you think? Well, they're they're going to they're going to use this, and they're, what they're going to say is they're you know one of the biggest challenges we have is you know most of our our uh, vegetables, a lot of produce, um, grains have glyphosate in them, right? Which is this ter- it's 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 this terrible chemical to kill all the bugs off the. And so what they their their pitch on this is like, well, what if the food there is a food shortage? We need to have, you know, tons an abundance of food, and so we need to use this chemical called glyphosate to keep all the bugs out, so that our harvests are bigger, right? And now it's studies are coming out to show that glyphosate is probably the cause of lots of can- cancers, a lot of some of these childhood mental disorders, mm-hmm. all these things. But it's all in the name of like, oh, we got to have abundance, we got to have abundance, and that's what I'm saying, man. Let's Let's take our money. Let's vote with our dollars. Let's take money out of the big corporate food system. Let's take money out of the big corporate healthcare system and own that for ourselves because we need more people to vote with their with their dollars. Yeah, it doesn't right? matter what people say. It matters what they do. It matters what they do. Right. Yeah, they're like if, if you're moaning and groaning about the the insurance system and you're paying into the insurance system, like stop moaning and groaning. Like you're paying into it. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is now you have an alternative. If you're moaning and groaning about the crap that you're buying at the grocery store, go buy your stuff from the local rancher. Stop complaining. Go do something about it. Vote. And um, yeah, vote with your dollars because you're going to be able to to provide dollars to people who are really trying to change the way that we, you know, access, you know, some of these necessities in life, healthcare, food. You know, those types of things. So vote with your dollars. That would be my number one takeaway today. Vote yeah, with your dollars. Yeah, I agree. I mean, they, as I mentioned, they said a 77% increase in cancer. Imagine what that's going to do to insurance premiums. It's going to yeah. rip the wealth out Crazy. of the middle class, out of people that are barely getting by. These GLP-1s, you know, the, do you know what GLP-1 no. is? So these are these weight loss drugs, Ozempic. Um, oh, yeah. And so Ozempic, and there's a bunch of different names for them. But 
what we're what I think we're going to see is those insurance companies are going to start paying for those things to reduce the obesity, but their costs are going to go up significantly because these drugs are really really expensive. So what happens is you take this drug, you lose a lot of weight, and they the theory is that a lot of your kind of met- metabolic health um, improves as you lose lose weight. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, you lose a lot of muscle mass also, and so your metabolic health actually doesn't improve all that much. And then as soon as you get off <laughs> yeah. of these drugs, yeah. guess what? You gain the weight back. Yeah. You know, and so it's like this short-term, you know, uh, view. It's such, it's such, a it's a, it's such a hustle. It's such a hustle. Yeah. But get, the pharma companies are making a mint on this. Mm-hmm. You know, the insurance companies are going to be able to raise their premiums. They're going to make more money. You know, it's not really going to reduce, you know, all the big high margin, uh, you know, surgeries that the hospitals do. So they're fine with it too. It's just a big hustle. It's a big hustle. Has that already started? Yeah, it's already started. Interesting. Yeah. It's, it's North Carolina, I think just came out, I don't know, three or four weeks ago, maybe that, and they basically said, we really got to look at this close because our rates are going to be up big time next year. If we still are able to, you know, uh, pay for this stuff, so it's it's going to it's going to happen. You're going to see it next year. Can There's insurance no companies uh, mandate certain procedures for you to get coverage? Uh, mandate certain procedures, like for they example, can, like one of these things or um, any of that. Uh, I don't know if they can. I love how we have to say now yeah. one of these things. Um, I don't know if they can mandate it, um, but they for sure can tell you not to get certain procedures. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, it's uh, what what do you uh, what do you see the difference uh, unfolding inside of the healthcare industry outside of what you just mentioned? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a really good question. I, I think look, unfortunately, what's what there's going to be two tribes. There's going to be a tribe that says um, the government should own it all, so it's a a one payer system. You know, so basically, basically what happens is we all have Medicare, which means that the government is fully responsible for all of our healthcare needs. There's this other tribe that is going to say, no, no, let me be responsible for my own health care. Let me pay for my own health care. Clearly, that's the tribe that I'm in. And there's going to be a battle of these these two tribes. And it's not too different, I don't think, than the battle of which has just started on the monetary side. And I know that we won't get too much into this, but there's a tribe that says, hey, the government should be able to print as much money and take care of us. And there's a tribe that says, no, there should be a different currency that the government can't touch called, you know, Bitcoin or crypto. I'm I'm Bitcoin only, but so it's a Bitcoin. But I think those those tribes will align. Um there's a there's another one in the food system, a tribe that says, hey, it should be all big corporate. We should have mass volumes versus the tribe that says, no, 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 we need small volumes but high quality from our and 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 local. And so I think that's it it's gonna be interesting to see how how those tribes, you know, battle, right? Um and in the healthcare system, government has slowly but surely taken off over more and more of our of our healthcare. They're going to continue to try to do that, you know, going forward. And that's that's why we need people to stand up and be like, "That's not what we want." That's yeah, not what we want. Yeah, we see that every day with uh, or Eric, my wife Erica, whenever mm-hmm. she has to speak with a doctor, or speak to any like about you know Jonathan getting hurt or something happening, they always ask all these different questions yeah. that have nothing to do with the actual injury. <laughs> Like right. just trying to sell us something. Yeah, like we don't. We're not interested. Yeah, like can you fix his arm or can't you fix his arm? Yeah, exactly. Right, and it's just like it feels like they're almost like insurance salesmen. Yeah, there's there's. Some, I don't want my doctor to be a salesman. Yeah, like I want my doctor to help me with what I actually need help with. Right, and right. I want to pay you for that service. It's back between the doctor and the patient. That doctor patient relationship has got to be there, and people have to stop being like, I don't know, it's my health. Like that's just too too complex. It's like, no, no, no. Like you have access to so much information right now that you should be able to figure this out. Right. Well, do you know what percentage of income comes from if you know, let's say for example, you have a medical sales rep that visits a doctor's office and they have uh, this new you know solution to a problem mm. and they present this solution to the doctor. And then the doctor obviously is paid to sell that solution, right? Oftentimes, yes. Yeah. Like, do you know what percentage of income usually comes from like doctors making those types of I don't, deals? I, I don't know what that is. Um, I don't know what that is. I, I think it's it's it actually is more when the doctors and within one of these hospital systems, then the doctor refers people to somebody within the hospital system. There's incentives more for them to do that as opposed to some of these these pharma. Although I think it, there's still that still happens. Yeah. But I think people have like significantly reduced that over the last decade, um, but have increased this 
kind of referral to another doctor within the system. Um, it's not a direct tie, but the, the, the your hospital system, who's your employer, um, will will look at that to, to gauge how much they're going to be paying you um, in bonuses that year. So since you guys take a new spin on healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, do you guys have a different way in which you guys like educate? I guess you have someone new that comes in. You educate them on you know diet. You educate them on health. You educate them on certain things that kind of reduce likelihood that they're going to have some type of expense. Yeah, and not only that, but what we're doing is you know so we think it's really important again back to community to have community, and so what we're yeah. doing is building communities. Um, we have our OG community, what we call it, you know, our original community. We've got a community of people who are just Bitcoiners, mm -hmm. um, and they would just fund each other's. Um, we're building a community of low carb carnivore keto people, yeah. um, so that they are, you know, in, community. in community together. Um, there's a governor on that too, interestingly, where it's uh, your blood sugar or your fasting insulin levels have to be a certain level for you to get into that crowd. That's awesome. So it actually incentivizes people to to good act behavior. good in, in good behavior. Um, we also, you know, have limits. The only two limits that we have is smoking um, and uh, obesity. So if you're over 280 pounds, um, you are not eligible for crowd health. We have one guy. It's an amazing story. He lost, I think, 60 or 70 pounds just to be a member of Crowd Health. That's, and then that's, that's he sent awesome. me a picture of him and his wife. I think he had come in like third in a triathlon, and she came in in second in a triathlon, and they were both overweight before joining Crowd Health. Yeah. So we need to see some incentive system to people improving their health. And, you know, for some reason, being in that community, people are like incentivized to change their behavior. So the crowd, average Crowd Health member, is five points lower than the national average in body mass index. Interesting. Yeah, because you ever see like the Calvin Klein ads or the uh, Sports Illustrated ads from the 90s? Yeah, versus like these, today. Like, these girls that are in like tip top shape, really take care of their bodies. And then the girls today are like, like, yeah, we're, we're not like, sure how we're this like, really works. We want to be out. like the Calvin Kleins of the 1980s and the 1990s yeah. or the Sports Illustrated that all of us guys like hid under our, you know, beds or whatever yeah. in the 1990s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Right. As opposed to now, which is like, oh my gosh, like really? Um, yeah, that's that's what we want to do. I need to do a meme around that or something. There's something there. Yeah, for you, sure. You can work on it. Work on it with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's pretty cool. So you have all these different kind of communities yeah, yeah. that are like, are they scattered by location or just by interest? It's just interest right now. Although we, we think that there's some kind of locational component, um, and we we have some others that we're thinking about if we can get enough scale. We need a couple thousand people and in, in the in the community to get the scale like a, a holistic or integrative group, naturopathic, because we're having we're seeing more and more people who are interested in doctors who are trying to get to the core root of their condition as opposed to just treating symptoms. Mm -hmm. With six minutes, it's hard to treat the the core issue. You're forced to just treat the symptom. All right. And if you're f treating symptoms, that's t typically a pharmaceutical answer. Right. Whereas mo more people are saying, hey, I want to be a uh, part of a, you know, a holistic group, integrative, which means a little bit of East and a little bit of West or a naturopathic. Um, and and that, that allows me to get to the core root of this issue as opposed to just you know taking a steroid and getting rid of it. Yeah, right? sure. So we're, we're building a naturopathic holistic group too. Because a lot of those services aren't paid for by health, health insurance anyway. Um, so people are looking for an alternative way to pay for those things. A lot of the, um, I guess a lot of people inside the network and crowd health, they come from referral or how do you get a lot of the, yeah, I mean, interestingly, I think last month was like 50% of our new customers came from existing customers, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. You know, and then the rest is me going on podcasts like this one, you know, thank you again for letting me on. Um, and just like telling our story and be like, Hey, if this is interesting to you. If you want to break free of this, you know, health insurance, um, you know, jail, um, you know, come and join us. And, and so most people find, find us through podcasts. Um, so yeah. Are you able to also advertise online? Like, do they let you advertise on Facebook? Yeah, we can, like we can, we just don't do a lot of advertising. Yeah. You know, like most of our, our, you know, quote unquote advertising, which we don't really pay for is getting on and just telling the story. Cause you got to tell the story as opposed to being like, if I had a banner ad up there that says alternative to health insurance, no, yeah. nobody, you know, <laughs> yeah. like you're not that interested, like, right. okay, like whatever. Um, but if you can hear the story of, you know, how I went through this and how, why I made the decision and some of the benefits, then I think people are really kind of like, okay, like that, that's cool. That's interesting. Yeah. And then you can do some more research and make sure, you know, you can go on Trustpilot right now, which is the way where, where we collect our members reviews. So members can go in and review us. We have almost 22, oh, excuse me, 200 
reviews on Trustpilot. You can read through them, and just people like it brings me tears. Like yeah, watching people, some of these yeah. people. Like we've had members who have lost their babies, you know, like right after they were born, and they like gave us paragraphs worth of reviews, like how we love them well, and how we took care of them, and how we sent them flowers, and all these things. You would never get that from your health insurance plan. No, like you're a part of the family. You yeah. know, like we care about you. Um, just really quick on that. One of the things I hate about health insurance is you call into an 800 number and it goes to somewhere in a different country and they can't really talk speak English and you have to explain to them what's going on with you and they have to then transfer you to somebody else who transfers you to somebody else. I'm like, I hate that crap. Yeah. Right. At Crowd Health, you have a care advocate internally. It's the same person that answers all of your questions. They get to know you. They get to know your family. You get to know her. Um, and it's just really cool to like have somebody as your advocate internally who knows what's going on with you, right? Um, as opposed to getting bounced around, uh, you know, a hundred different people. So the vast majority of your communications will be with one person. If you have something big and complex, we bring in a couple other people to help out with that. But yeah, most of the time it's one person internally that you get to have a relationship with, which I think is great. I think it's awesome. I think one of the biggest uh, industries that needs disruption is healthcare. Yeah, I think, uh, and I think. Uh, you guys disrupt it. You guys are going to do a lot of good for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, I, we, we appreciate it. You know, like I said, we have, we've had 7,500 people use us now. Um, the models worked awesome. Um, big, big expenses, colon cancer cases, brain hemorrhages, NICU babies, um, you know, m major surgeries, heart surgeries, brain surgeries, are all, all we were able to get those as well as like a little pediatric visit, you know, yeah. like, it's 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 worked really really well. I think thirteen thousand bills now is is what we're up to. Wow. Yeah. And the website's crowdhealth.com. Join crowdhealth.com. Join crowdhealth.com. Yeah. And all of our Insta, our uh, Instagram and Twitter, um, Facebook is join crowd health. So come in and uh, and see us there. We we tend to be a little bit sassy, a little bit sharp towards the the medical industrial complex there. So it's it's kind of fun to come in and and see that. You so, got to. Yeah. yeah. I'll leave all of your links in the awesome. description below. And uh, thanks for coming on, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate you.